The time is at hand. The Army Air Forces has announced that a flying disc has been found and is now in the possession of the Army. When we are successful, and we will be, we have a real chance at this new world order. One of the many spirits said to haunt the area. Unknown animal attack. We need a great reset. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen. Welcome to In Dark Places. My name is Jumbo Fugit. Here in the States, it's Memorial Day weekend. And in the meat department, it's our time to shine. It's our first big holiday of the year. And all the guys that I work with are just super excited and freaking out. And I don't know, they just, they're way too easily amused over meat, I guess. I don't know. It's kind of weird. And there at the beginning I said, here in the States. Did you catch that? That reminded me of me and my cousin Ryan. We used to go into chat rooms. Remember those? We go in chat rooms and mess with people all the time. And just talk stupid to them, ask like weird questions and we would say stuff like, Can I ask you the question? And can I ask you the other question? And stuff like that. I remember this one girl said she was from Kentucky and I said, Is it muddy there? You know, we just did stupid stuff like that. But one of our big highlights was whenever someone would say, I live in the States. And our big comeback for that was, which ones? And that kind of reminded me of that story. So it was fun times from my past. Which states do you live in? And now here is the Nicolas Cage Meltdown of the Week. Your fault. See what you did? You made me hit a woman. Because you couldn't finish the job. Well, you're going to finish it now. Come on. Alright, okay. Where's that poison? I still got this right to my pocket. Take it out. Open it up. Okay. Throw it on the rack. Pour it on the rack! Cover your mouth with it. People, animal, and ordinary household objects that vanish into thin air or appear suddenly in unlikely places. These have always been a part of folklore, but as Lynn Picknett points out, the disappearances continue. Now you see her, now you don't. So runs the stage illusionists traditional patter as he makes his assistant disappear. It's a skillful and enjoyable trick, this disappearing act. But even in the everyday world, far from the stage door, there have been many disappearances and strange reappearances. Only for a handful of them are there rational explanations. Most of them are so extraordinary that they almost defy belief. On November 29th, my mom's birthday, 1809, <laughs> Benjamin Bathurst, an employee of the British Foreign Office, was about to board a coach outside an inn near Berlin. He went to look at the horses and vanished forever. In June of 1900, Sherman Church ran into a cotton mill at Augusta Mills near Lake Michigan. He never came out and could not be found again. In 1974, pigs, sheep, and heifers vanished from two farms near Manchester, England. Weird and apparently random phenomena such as these were the province of Charles Hoy Fort, an American who published his 
Book of the Damned in 1919. This, his most famous book, is a collection of well-attested stories with a few sly hints that the natural world is one huge practical joke expressed through reigns of frogs, as mentioned in a couple episodes ago. People who disappear into nothing and people who come from nowhere. Charles Fort coined the word teleportation to describe the forcible removal of a person or object from one place or even plane of existence to another by agencies unknown and unseen. According to taste, these forces have been ascribed to God, the devil, spirit guides, fairies, and UFOs. Sometimes the teleportee seems to be actually in two places at once. This phenomenon is called bilocation. A famous case of bilocation occurred in 1620 when a young nun, Sister Mary of Agreda in Spain, embarrassed her superiors with her persistent tales of her missionary flights to the Jumano Indians in Mexico. She claimed she regularly made the 2,000 mile journey. No one was prepared to take her seriously, especially as she was not missed at the convent in Agreda, and she made the far-fetched claim during her flight she noticed that the earth was round yet the official papal missionary assigned to the Jumano Father Alonso de Benavides complained to the Pope in 1622 that the Indians had already been taught about the Catholic faith by a mysterious lady in blue who had handed out rosaries crucifixes and even a chalice which proved to be from the covenant in Agreda. While being closely questioned by Father Benavides, Sister Mary revealed a detailed knowledge of the Indians' way of life and language and described individual members of the tribe accurately. Like most teleportation stories, that of Sister Mary and her missionary activities seemed to defy classification and analysis. The fact that she saw that the earth was round indicates some kind of astral travel, yet the chalice was solid enough. The unsolved mystery of the missing Beaumont children with a one million dollar reward that still stands. On January 26th, 1966, pick up sticks, 57 years ago, three children took the bus to a beach near their home in Adelaide, South Australia, as they had done many times before, enjoying playing in the sand and surf under the watchful eye of the oldest sister. This time, however, they would never return home and never be seen by their parents again. Or here we go, and we're going to revisit one of Australia's most heartbreaking cold cases. Jane, Anna, and Grant Beaumont, who would become collectively known as the Beaumont children, were three Australian siblings aged nine, seven, and four years old, respectively. They became household names after disappearing from the South Australian Glenig Beach near Adelaide on Australia Day in what remains a suspected abduction and murder case. The case remains one of Australia's most tragic, and to this day, information related to the cold case comes with a $1 million reward from the South Australian government. The Beaumont children's vanishing left Australia in pieces and was described by crime writer Michael Madigan who authored the uh, 2016 book, The Missing Beaumont Children, 50 Years of Mystery and Misery, as the day that safety ended. Australia Day, 1966, was like any other for Nancy Beaumont, the mother of three children. She entrusted nine-year-old Jane, who was described by her father Jim as having the brain of a girl of 15, despite her younger years with taking her younger siblings down to the beach. 
Reports show that just the day before, the young children had made a similar trip unaided successfully. Jim also showed them the day before how far out they could swim. Mr. Madigan noted, reminding them not to talk to strangers. When the children left that fateful morning, the parents' last memory of their children was a happy one. The children were spotted at 10.15 a.m. at the beach and were due back just under two hours later. But when Nancy went to meet them, the children were nowhere to be found. Five hours later, their parents reported them as missing to the nearby Glenegg police station. Jim later told Mr. Madigan, I knew there was something wrong if they weren't home. The thought going through my mind was that they had been taken away. I don't think they could have been drowned because there were so many people down there. Police originally scoured the Beaumont's home to ensure the children were hiding there before rolling out their search operation to the town. By the following morning, rescue boats were enlisted to boost the chances of finding the youngsters. Police cars blasting out pleas for information about the children descended on the town center. Soon, taxi drivers helped too, asking all of their passengers for assistance in finding the missing trio. Jim described how he felt that some, somebody must be holding them against their will. They would otherwise have come home by now. Adding, it's a complete mystery. I can't understand it. My kids will be crying their eyes out. It's like a nightmare. But as the days and weeks went on, it became clear this nightmare wouldn't soon end for the Beaumonts. In an Australia Day Telegraph interview from 1967, Nancy said that the longer this goes on, the more confident I feel that they are alive. And there you have it. The missing Beaumont children. Thanks, Jimmy. The sudden appearance of solid objects, often in sealed rooms, is called apportation. Apports can be literally anything, from stones or musical instruments to a dish of hot food or fresh flowers cut out of season. Apportation seems to be a favorite diversion of poltergeists or so-called mischievous spirits. Disturbed houses often provide the setting for spectacular apports appearing from thin air. Hans Bender, director of the Institute for Border Areas of PSI in Freiburg, West Germany, has this to say of experiences of things that go bump in the night. Stones, for instance, come into closed rooms from outside a house during poltergeist attacks. Witnesses described the stones falling from about five or six inches from the ceiling. They don't bounce, and when you touch them, they are usually warm. In one case in Bavaria in 1969, stones came into a closed kitchen and objects flew out of the locked door. Some little dolls came out of a closed cupboard, seemingly through the very fabric of the door and the people saw small bottles, perfume and medicine bottles, coming from the roof of the house. Interestingly, when the bottles were seen coming from the house, they were not falling in a straight line, but in a zigzag fashion, as if they were being transported, not as if they were falling free. This notion of apports being carried by an invisible force accords perfectly with the spiritualists belief that solid objects can be dematerialized and materialized through the agency of spirits. One spirit guide named White Hawk described how he does it. I can only explain it by saying that I speed up the atomic vibrations until the stones are disintegrated. Then they are brought here and I slow down the vibrations until they become solid again. Spiritualists often explain the inability of most mortals to see the other side, which is said to interpenetrate our world in space and time, by pointing out that the material world is dense matter which vibrates slowly. 
the spiritual plane is refined matter, vibrating too fast for our physical perceptions. A sudden change in atomic vibration removes objects or people from one plane to another, or one place to another, rather like the beaming up and beaming down of the personnel of Star Trek's Starship Enterprise. Vanishing people have always been part of the world's folklore. Fairies, giants, spirits, and recently, UFOs have allegedly abducted hundreds, perhaps thousands of people. Fairies were infamous for their trick of abducting healthy babies and leaving weak changelings behind instead. And various demons of legend have been blamed for removing folk from before their very eyes of their friends. But some unfortunate people disappear without any apparent supernormal agency. These random and pointless disappearances fascinated Fort, who collected a formidable dossier of them. The victims are often typically men in the street, uninterested in the paranormal, on whom some practical jokes seem to have been played. The joke was distinctly unfunny for a man in 1655 who was going about his business in Goa, India, when he suddenly found himself back in his birthplace, Portugal. This abrupt return home was witnessed by enough people to ensure it came to the ears of the Inquisition, who naturally for them assumed he was a practicing sorcerer. He was tried and burned at the stake. In Connecticut in January 1888, passers-by were astonished by the sudden materialization of six people in the street. All six were suffering from concussions. Perhaps the most ironical dematerialization was that of the stage magician, William Neff, as related by his friend L.J. Nebel, the American broadcaster. This extraordinary happening took place at the Paramount Theater in New York. There were few people in attendance, and Neff went into his magician's patter routinely. His friend Nebel heard none of it. He was transfixed by the gradual dematerialization of the artist. Neff became so translucent that the stage curtains could be seen through him. Curiously, the magician seemed to have been unaware of his nebulous state and continued with his patter. Gradually, he became solid again, beginning with a vague outline. Confronted by Nebel with this amazing occurrence, Neff confessed it was nothing whatever to do with his act. However, he was no stranger to the phenomenon. He had once partially dematerialized during his act at Chicago, and once casually in front of his very shaken wife. One supposes that if he ever learned how to reproduce this freak happening at will, he would have become a very rich man. Hi, I got something to show you. Something you like, Down. Nothing's soft and better. Downy gets things so soft, they're cuddly soft. And Downy made the price smaller, so it costs you much less now. Mmm, maple fresh, only with Downy. Listen, everybody, if you want April fresh clothes that are cuddly soft, look for me. April fresh Downy now costs you less. That's terrifying. So, uh, I've heard of this before, but, um, thought it would fit in here. The Dyatlov Pass incident. It was 1959 when a group of nine experienced hikers suddenly disappeared in the snowy mountains of Russia called Ural Mountains, also known as Dead Mountain. Now, that should be a little hint to, uh, Stay away and not go up Dead Mountain. Thank you. It took more than three months to locate all the bodies, but the circumstances around their deaths are still unanswered today. 
The group consisted of seven men and two women of whom were attempting to hike to reach Mount Ortertine. They planned a two-week trek up the snowy mountain. The trekkers pitched their tents at the base of the slope, and soon an intense minus 19 degrees Celsius blizzard chilled through the night. And that was the last we know of them being alive. They were found in a forest one mile from the campsite in various stages of undress, without their skis, shoes, or coats. Two of them had fractured skulls, two of them suffered chest fractures, and another one of the hikers had a missing tongue. The case was abruptly closed, and the deaths were ruled as a result of a compelling natural force, stating that the hikers died due to hypothermia. The mystery has obsessed people ever since. Most people didn't take the police's word for it. As you can probably assume, people had a lot of questions regarding this mysterious case. Why would someone's tongue be missing due to a natural force? Why were they partially undressed? And which natural force are they referring to? But it gets even weirder. The investigators found the tent badly damaged and that it had been cut open from the inside. All their supplies were safely located inside. It makes you wonder, why would they go outside into the freezing cold if they had a perfectly good tent to hide in from the storm with access to their warm gear? Although the only plausible explanation as to why one of the hikers' tongues had been missing seems to be that someone or something physically removed it. There was no proof that any other people had been nearby their campsite. Many theorists also question the sudden closing of the case by the Soviet government and in turn theorized their possible involvement in the incident, saying that the campsite was a nuclear testing ground. To this day, nobody to this day has been able to provide a plausible explanation for their deaths. No, okay, I'm not saying it's space aliens, right? But it goes without saying it's... All right, I cut out the last part right there for a PG-rated show that we have here. But, uh, I don't know, what do you guys think it was? I did not mean to violate... Thank you. Someone whose fate and fortune seem inextricably linked is the Israeli sensitive Yuri Geller. Although, as far as we know, not a teleportee, his very presence in a house provokes a flurry of apports. Professor John Hasted, head of the Department of Physics at Birkbeck College, University of London, set up a test to see if the young Israeli could in any way alter the structure of a vanadium carbide crystal chosen for its particular hardness and its rarity. It was laid on a piece of metal and enclosed in a cellulose capsule. First, the professor interposed his hand between Geller and the crystal. Then, as witnesses watched, Geller moved his hand and the crystal jumped twice like a jumping beam. Apparently, this was all Geller had intended to do because Professor Hasted says, Gellinger stopped concentrating and we looked at the capsule. Only half of the crystal was there. It would have been impossible for him to have broken the capsule by ordinary means. After Geller had paid a short visit to Professor Hasted's home, solid objects began to behave unpredictably. A small ivory ornament appeared out of thin air. Not flying, but dropping to the ground from about a foot above the floor. There was also the key of a French Empire clock that teleported from one room to the next. I found it on the floor. Like I says floor. <laughs> By the kitchen door. And put it back in its proper place. I walked back into the kitchen and found it lying in the same place on the floor. 
Yuri Geller seems to have a psychokinetic ability that he can only partially control or predict. Ironically, it is this very lack of control that many people consider argues for his geniusness. Anything too glib implies rehearsal or sleight of hand. This suspicion attached itself to the feats of many famous Victorian mediums. So many of them proved to fake their seances that any curious phenomenon attached to their movement became suspect. Even the founder of Theosophy, the controversial Madame Blavatsky, was frequently suspected of sleight of hand. For example, a whole tea set conveniently fell out of the sky during a picnic and, more tellingly, her teleported messages, allegedly from her master in Tibet, contained whole passages from a recently published American sermon. A fact that, while it does not directly challenge the reality of the teleported letter, reveals the Tibetan master as a plagiarist and, on the whole, not the sort of guru whose word should be taken as gospel. Another medium whose phenomena were both spectacular and open to question was Mrs. Guppy, who, while still Miss Nicole, produced upwards of six anomalies, fifteen crystals, and assorted flowers at a London seance in 1867. One of her more startling feats, however, seems to be genuine. On the evening of June 3rd, 1871, Mrs. Guppy, attired in her nightgown, was sitting quietly in the breakfast room of her Highbury home. Busy with the household accounts, a friend was with her when suddenly she disappeared and appeared in a room in Lamb's Conduit Street, a few miles away, where a seance was in progress. Still clutching her accounts book and in a trance, that she was as solid in Lamb's Conduit Street as in Highbury was born out of the fact that her materialization caused some buffeting around the seance table. There was a heavy thud on the table, and one of the sitters cried out, Good God, there is something on my head. One sympathizes, Mrs. Guppy was described as the biggest woman in London. She weighed over 230 pounds, and as she was something of a figure of fun, the whole story, instead of being the psychic proof of the phenomenon of teleportation so many mediums were looking for, became the biggest joke for years. Ford, with his theory of the cosmic joke, might have pointed out that Mrs. Guppy's name, size, and joke reputation were precisely why it was she, and not, say, Queen Victoria, who was selected for this astonishing physical demonstration, and why it was a stage illusionist who dematerialized before your very eyes. The famous case of the Mary Celeste. On December 5th, 1872, the captain of the Brigantine de Gracia sighted a ship sailing so clumsily that he went to investigate. The mystery deepened as he explored the abandoned Mary Celeste. Although showing signs of some storm damage, she was still seaworthy. One lifeboat had apparently been launched rather than having been washed overboard, but there was still plenty of fresh water aboard. Provisions for six months were intact and the crew's clothes, including their oil skins, were hanging on their pegs. On one bunk, a child's toys lay as if in mid-game. Everywhere there were signs of abrupt abandonment. However, the ship's navigation instruments and some papers were missing, although the log remained. The only signs of something bizarre were two long grooves apparently etched into the wood above the waterline, blood-like stains on the deck 
and the captain's sword in his deserted cabin and a mysterious cut in the ship's rail. What really happened? Did the crew fall victim to illness, insanity, homicide, suicide, or the delusion that they were sinking? Were they abducted by giant sea creatures or spacemen, as some suggest? The theories are many, but it seems very likely that we shall never know for certain In 1878, a Dr. Moore and his three friends were touring Ireland. They put up for the night at an inn at Dromgray in Wicklow. Something prompted the doctor to tell his tale about how he had been abducted many times as a child by fairies, only to be rescued by the intervention of the local witch's magic. And even as he spoke, the whole process went into motion again. He saw a troop of men come into the inn and drag him off with them. Frightening enough for him, but terrifying for the three witnesses. For all they saw was Dr. Moore being pulled out of his chair and out of the room by an invisible but irresistible force. His friends made a grab at him, but the force was too strong and he vanished into the night. The innkeeper recommended they send for the local wise woman. She explained that the doctor had been abducted by the local fairies and was their prisoner in the nearby wood. She could break their hold on him, but her spell would only work for his release if he could be made to abstain from food and drink during his imprisonment. If not, he would return, but soon would weaken and die. She cast her spell, and they all waited. The next morning at dawn, Dr. Moore came back to the inn, starving and thirsty, complaining that all the refreshments he had been offered during the night had inexplicably been dashed out of his hand. Unknown to him, the woman's spell had been working and had finally secured his release. As morning came, he had discovered he was suddenly alone near the inn. The three witnesses attested to the story. It was published as a pamphlet and signed by one J. Cottam. A copy is now preserved in the British Museum. On November 5th, 1975, Travis Walton, a young forester, and his five workmates were driving to work near Snowflake, Arizona. They suddenly saw a bright light hovering over their truck. As the driver, Mike Rogers, stopped the car, Travis felt an extraordinary compulsion to approach the light. He jumped out and rushed toward it. There was a sudden flash of light and Travis hit the ground. Terrified, the others drove off. When they had calmed down, they returned to the same spot and instigated a thorough search that was to last for five days and cover miles of the Arizona desert and forest. Suspicion naturally fell on the five friends, but their distress seemed completely genuine and their story held up even under close questioning with the aid of a lie detector. Five days later, a confused and shaken Walton appeared in Herber, a small town close to Snowflake. His story tallied with that of his friends, as far as theirs went, but he added some amazing details. The beam of light had knocked him unconscious and then somehow drawn him up into a spacecraft, which he was examined by fetus-like creatures before being dumped in Herber. The 1880s saw a large number of disappearances from East London, known to this day as the West Ham Disappearances. One of the first victims was little Eliza Carter, who vanished from her home, but later appeared in the street and spoke to some of her school friends. They tried to persuade her 
to go home to her family. But she said she couldn't. They wouldn't let her. She was seen around West Ham for a couple days before finally disappearing forever. A similar case was that of Private Jerry Unwin of the U.S. Army, who disappeared, reappeared, absented himself, and appeared once more before vanishing again on August 1st, 1959. The experience was not pleasant, and a far cry from the semi-mystical experience of the abductees portrayed in the film Close Encounters of the Third Kind, but it was akin to the whole history of mysterious abductions. The late psychic and writer Wesley Tudor Pohl recounted a strange tale of teleportation in his book The Silent Road. On a wet and stormy night in December 1952, I found myself at a country station some mile and a half from my Sussex home. The train from London had arrived late. The bus had gone and no taxis were available. The rain was heavy and insistent. The time was 5.55 p.m. and I was expecting an important trunk call from overseas at 6 p.m. at home. The situation seemed desperate. To make matters worse, the station call box was out of order and some trouble on the line made access to the railway telephone impossible. In despair, I sat down in the waiting room and having nothing better to do, I compared my watch with the station clock, allowing for the fact that this is always kept two minutes in advance. I was able to confirm the fact that the exact time was 5.57 p.m., three minutes to zero hour. What happened next, I cannot say. When I came to myself, I was standing in my hall at my home, a good 20 minute walk away, and the clock was striking six. My telephone call dully came through a few minutes later. Having finished my call, I awoke to the realization that something very strange had happened. Then, much to my surprise, I found that my shoes were dry and free from mud, and that my clothes showed no sign of damp or damage. Like all such stories, there is something very incomplete about this strange tale. Wesley Tudor Pohl had told all he can remember, but inevitably, the phenomenon raises questions he cannot answer. As there were no witnesses in the case, no one will ever know how or if the telephone disappeared. Did he literally vanish? Was he teleported invisibly? How did he reappear? But at least one thing seems certain. What triggered off the teleporting agency seems to have been no less than the writer's own will. He was desperate to get home in time for his telephone call, and his anxiety seems to have put into motion whatever natural law it is that governs the occurrence of the phenomenon. Desire could also explain the bilocation of Sister Mary of Agreda. Intense piety and missionary zeal could have generated the unknown energies needed to transport a facsimile of herself to Mexico. One of the most frequently repeated stories of mysterious disappearances concerning an entire Norfolk regiment allegedly abducted by a UFO in 1915, the day the Norfolks disappeared. There are many strange accounts of people having been abducted by a UFO. In most cases, the unfortunate victim is returned to Earth and unable to tell his story, often to an incredulous audience who not unnaturally express considerable disbelief. But sometimes the victim disappears forever, his fate to remain unknown. These cases are rare because a number of witnesses are required if more prosaic explanations for the disappearance are to be dismissed. Of this latter category is the case of the vanishing Norfolks. One of the most bizarre of such incidents and accordingly featured in dozens of books about UFOs, the Bermuda Triangle, and other paranormal mysteries. But is it 
can it possibly be true? The incident allegedly took place in August 1915 during the ill-fated Gallipoli campaign. According to a statement made by three of the original witnesses, 22 members of a New Zealand field company saw a large number of British soldiers later identified as the 1st 4th Norfolk Regiment march into a strange loaf of bread shaped cloud that was straddling a dry creek bed. After the last man had entered, the cloud lifted and moved off against the wind. Not one of the soldiers were ever seen again. There are not many cheap hotels that offer superb hospitality in an atmosphere of old world charm. Four friends, however, discovered just such a place. Or did they? Holiday memories tend to blur with time, but for Lynn and Cynthia Gesby and their friends Jeff and Pauline Simpson, whose story was first reported in the Dover Express of October 11th, 1982, the trip they took together in October 1979 is one they will never forget. The foursome were driving through France en route for their holiday in Spain when they decided to call it a day and find a hotel. They stopped at a motel on the main Mont Le Maire Nord auto route, but it was fully booked and they were told to try a road further on. It was 10 p.m when the couples from Dover eventually found an old hotel set in a tree-lined lane just off the main auto route. They pulled into a lay-by opposite the building and parked the car. Having driven several hundred kilometers that day, the Gisbys and Simpsons were naturally feeling tired and the old world atmosphere that greeted them when they pushed open the heavy wooden door of the hotel was a comforting one. The landlord, a jovial middle-aged man, had no trouble in understanding English. After booking two rooms, the friends settled down to a meal of steak, eggs, and chips served up on an old-fashioned plate. There were tankards of larger to follow. Satisfied with the meal, the couples decided to turn in for the night. There were some surprises in store for them when they investigated their rooms. We were struck by how old-fashioned they were, said Lynn. The beds were very high, with bolsters instead of pillows, and there were thick sheets of several blankets, and the windows didn't have any glass in them, just wooden shutters. The doors didn't have any locks on them either, just wooden latches. We weren't all that bothered because everything was very comfortable and being in rural France, we just thought that was the way of life there. The bathroom, which was shared, was also somewhat unusual. The old fashioned tub was on legs and there was an equally ancient looking shower attached to the wall and covered by a grill. Even the soap, instead of the usual loose tablets, was attached to the bath by an iron rod. At 7 a.m. the next day, after a good night's sleep, the foursome sat down to a typical continental breakfast of coffee, bread, and jam. Just as they were finishing their meal, a young woman came in, followed immediately by two garden maids. Lynn was struck by the men's uniforms. Both wore gaiters, high hats, and capes, outfits quite dissimilar to the ones they had seen Garden Mays wearing the day before. Lynn said, The young woman was dressed strangely, too, in a long chiffon dress and button-up boots, the type I remember my granny used to wear. Lynn asked the Garden Mays for directions to the auto route for Avignon. The French policeman seemed puzzled at the word auto route, but 
They gave directions for Avignon, said Lynn. Once breakfast was over, Mr. Gisby sought out the landlord to settle the bill and was surprised to find the host charged him only 19 francs. I thought there must be a mistake, said Lynn. I reckoned on between 200 and 250 francs for the four of us, but he insisted the bill was right and I paid up. Before setting out for Spain, Lynn and Jeff took photographs of their wives standing by the shutters in their rooms. When they eventually set off, they found that there was an auto route to Avignon, though the garden maze had not been at all forthcoming about this, and their directions had referred only to the original Avignon Road. One doesn't pass up an opportunity to spend a cheap night in a comfortable hotel, so on their return from Spain, the Gisbys and Simpsons again turned off the Monte Limer Nord auto route into the tree-lined avenue they remembered the hotel being in. But the place had vanished. Thinking they must have missed it, they turned around and drove back. Three times they drove up and down the avenue, but the hotel was nowhere to be seen. Even the place where they had parked the car, the lay-by backed by a brick wall, was missing. I am certain, as can be, that we are on the right road, said Lynn. We went to the same Monte Lemar Nord turnoff, past the same motel where we had originally asked for accommodation, and where we had been advised to try down the road. We passed the same building on that road we passed before, with the same advertising sign on it, and the same road work sign. We couldn't have been on a different road. That was the main road between Avignon and Lyon, apart from the auto route. According to Lynn, everything about the place was the same, apart from the lay-by, the wall, and the hotel. The foursome were forced to continue to Lyon, where they stayed at a hotel that charged them 247 francs for bed and breakfast, evening meal and drinks. Puzzling over the strange event, the couples returned to Dover. Two weeks later, when the holiday photographs were developed, the mystery deepened. For on both rolls of film that Jeff and Lynn had taken, every photograph had come out with the exception of the ones taken at the Mystery Hotel. There were not even any spoiled negatives on the roll of film. It was as if the photographs had never been taken. Later talking over the bizarre occurrence with a French dressmaker friend, Lynn and Cynthia were surprised to learn that the three people they had seen that morning in the hotel must have been wearing clothes that dated back to the early 1900s. According to their friend, the style of the garden maze uniforms had certainly not been worn since 1905. Of all the explanations that the Gisbys and Simpsons had been given for Lynn and Cynthia, at least, only one seems to ring true. The couple are both sympathetic to the idea that what they experienced was a time slip. The phenomenon that involves a person moving backward or forward in time and seeing and participating in life as it once lived or as it will be lived. In the annals of disappearing people, there is no more controversial tale, nor one stranger than the alleged Philadelphia experiment. In 1943, there reportedly took place a horrifying experiment into invisibility involving a ship and its crew. This was not a psychic test, but a top secret experiment of the United States Navy. According to Charles Berlitz and William Moore in their book The Philadelphia Experiment, the surviving witnesses to the experiment still suffer harassment and have been repeatedly warned against discussing it by government agencies. And we did a deep dive on this like a couple years ago or something. Cool story. And we're still waiting for Al Bielik to get in touch with us. So if you're out there, Al, come on.
send us an email. We want to talk to you from the future, you know, because he died. Uh, yeah, back to the story, already in progress. A force field was created around the experimental ship, a destroyer, as it lay in a special berth in the Philadelphia Navy Yard. The crew could see one another normally, but witnesses could only see the vague outline of both ship and men through the force field. They shimmered like a heat haze before reassuming normal shape and density. The effect on the crewmen involved was said to be appalling. The after effects took various horrible forms. Some of the men are said to have suffered a particularly harrowing form of spontaneous human combustion, bursting into flames and burned brightly for 18 days. Some went mad, and yet others periodically became semi-transparent or partly invisible. Some died as a result of their experience. An eyewitness claimed to have seen the entire experiment take place, and even to have thrust his arm into the force field that surged in a counterclockwise direction around the little experimental navy ship. I watched the air all around the ship turn slightly darker than all the other air. I saw, after a few minutes, a foggy green mist arise like a thin cloud. I think this must have been a mist of atomic particles. I watched as it became rapidly invisible to human eyes, and yet to the precise shape of the keel and underhaul of the ship remained impressed into the ocean water. The field had a sheet of pure electricity around it as it flowed. My entire body was not within that force field when it reached maximum strength density and so I was not knocked down, but my arm and hand were only pushed backward. The U.S. Navy denies that the experiment took place, yet the story is too persistent and has too much inner consistency to be dismissed entirely. If Project Invisibility did take place, then it made scientific history, but compared to natural disappearances, it was clumsy and very dangerous. The U.S. Navy did have an interest in invisibility and can be verified, however. In September 1980, they made it known that they were experimenting with radar invisibility. But escaping a radar scan is a far cry from disappearing from human sight. If it were possible to harness the natural force that occasionally drags people from one place or plane of existence to another in a matter of seconds, or makes them invisible, then life as we know it would change completely. Whole armies could suddenly materialize unexpectedly in the country of their foes. Spies could invisibly slip past the guards at top secret installations. Criminals dematerialize when the law draws too close. Yet perhaps the clue, such as it is, lies in the very randomness of the phenomenon. Perhaps there is no natural force, but Paradoxically, a random law creating freak effects for their own sake. This suggests a governing intelligence, a cosmic joker, as we previously talked about a couple episodes ago, like the one who perhaps stage manages the manifestations of the Loch Ness Monster, UFO, Bigfoot, and who jams the witnesses' cameras at the critical moments or contrives to discredit witnesses. So, we come full circle. Is the Joker a god, a demon, a fairy, a spirit, or a UFO? Researcher Ivan T. Sanderson said of the UFO phenomenon, It cannot all be bumpkin, yet some of its implications are so bizarre as to be almost beyond comprehension. This could well apply to all 14 phenomena, those who disappear forever. Do they go to some other world, or some other plane, or do they find themselves in that other unexplored region, the furthest reaches of the human mind? If abductions are ascribed to agencies currently in vogue, put as Fort said in terms of the familiar, then the phenomenon must be at least partly in 
the mind, yet the disappearances are real. It is likely that such phenomena will remain unexplained until a comprehensive explanation for all the strange phenomena can be formulated. Until then, who knows? Thanks for listening. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Jimmy. Matt, Steve, Tim, James. Thanks, guys. We'll see you again right here next week. God bless you.